Sophie Promasenau is 79 years old. She married her husband, Murray, in 1933. Together, they had two daughters, Shirley and Barbara. Since Murray's passing in 1976, Dorothy has lived alone, dividing her time between Newton, Massachusetts and Pompano Beach, Florida, where this interview took place. I was born in a small town in Russia. It's called Monastrisht. And uh, I was born in 1911. What was Monastrisht like? It was a very, very small town. Before the revolution started, and there used to be the bandits, they used to come into the towns. And as they came into the towns, they got a hold of the bunch of Jews, or as many Jews as they could, and they, they put them in a, in, in a synagogue, and they'd burn it, or they'd hit them, or they'd... And my mother was caught that way. She was running to her father's house while we were being taken care of by my, by my other grandfather. And she was caught, and she was beaten, and they thought they left her for dead. But she was not dead. And when she was able to get out of there and crawl to her father's house, she did. And that's how she was left alive, but she was very badly beaten. When, when the, those bandits came into town, uh, either one, one relative or another would grab us and take us. We didn't know where. They always tried to hide us. So they would take us with them, and they'd hide us. And we never knew where my mother was, because my mother would be running off with some other way or with somebody else. And somebody would always take my sister and me and hide us in the woods. Sometimes we'd have to lay out in the deep woods the whole night. And um, that's how we lived. Helen Cohen is 81 years old. She was married to Dr. Lewis Cohen for 30 years until he passed away in 1962 at the age of 62. Together, they had two boys, David and Arthur. Helen currently spends her winters in Hollywood, Florida, and her summers in Brookline, Massachusetts, where she grew up. I was born July 29th, 1908. And where? In East Boston on Saratoga Street. Sure. We were always comfortable. My, fam my father always made a good living, and we never knew want. We weren't spoiled. We were taught the value of money. We lived in a three-decker home in Revere, very beautiful garden. My father had all fresh fruits and vegetables in the every year. And uh, we had a, a very nicely furnished home. As I say, we never had anything, wanted anything, but we did get everything wholesale. Very, very bad timing. For us, whatever we did was, time, was bad because coming to this country was difficult for the simple reason whatever small country that we came through, we had to sneak through the borders. If we were caught, we were put in jail. When we got into a small town, we would try to find Jews or where the Jews were. And we would go there. And as children, we went around begging for pieces of bread because there were a number of us children. If the parents were put in jail right away, we had, we had to do things for ourselves. And I was quite young. I was the older. I was, and it was my cousin, si my cousin Simon, he's gone now. Hi, he was gone now and my sister. So I was the oldest of the three of them, and I sort of had to take care of them, and I was probably no more than 10 or 11 years old. Well, another friend that I am still very close to is a girl who moved up on the third floor with her family. And uh, we have been friends. She was about five, so she was about seven years old. And I have been friends with her all these years, which is 77 years, 75 years. I thought she was always a very truthful, wonderful person and a wonderful friend. Well, to me, she was not a friend. She was more like a sister. If anything in my family or anything, I called, I told her about it, right? And we always kept in touch. We, I think we're almost the only ones left <laughs> yeah, right. from our group of friends. What was it like to get to know your father again after 45 years? That was years? the most amazing thing that has ever happened to me. 
I could never picture him because as a child I didn't picture him. And the first time I saw him was in, in Havana. When he came off, and my father was a tall and he was a handsome man, really a very, very good looking man. And I couldn't even say Papa. I couldn't call him by the name that you're supposed to. How do you, what do you, how do you call somebody that you don't know? So you would go out uh, dancing? Yeah. I, uh, a normal date. How many, I mean, how many boys in a year would you date? Oh, I don't remember. I always had a steady boyfriend. <laughs> Do you no, remember the names? I, I, did, I sure do. I sure do remember the names. Could we have a few? In fact, you brought me a picture of one of them. Oh, really? Yes. So the point that, what was his name? I'm not going to mention that. <laughs> he has since passed away. Can you tell me about um, your boyfriends? My boyfriend? I had more than one boyfriend, for God's sakes. You think I just had one boyfriend? <laughs> no, I had more boyfriends. We had boyfriends used to come into my home, my mother's home. I used to have parties. We used to have parties. We used to do what all the other young people did. After a while, uh, because we were pretty, so, you know, people don't, uh, they, they, they don't ignore pretty girls, actually. When he retired in 48, because of his, because of illness, People begged him, please just sit behind your desk so we can talk to you. When he walked into a room with his smile, always with a cigar in his mouth or a pipe, always, mostly a cigar, people would just feel better just talking to him. He had a certain charisma about him that whatever profession he would have gone into, he would have been a success. Of course, he worked day and night. There was no Fridays off. There was no Sundays off. Friday night, we could, had all we could do to go out to dinner. But once a month, we would take a trip to New York, and we would go to different musicals from Friday night to Sunday. And that was his relaxation away from the telephone. But he was good to his family. He, he was just good to the world. He was an unusual man. I can't, when it comes to him, there is no, no stopping about telling his good qualities. He was, he was a good, nice man. He was a man that was loved by men and, because he was, never, he was not a fool. He was an intelligent man. And he never would talk stupid talk or kibitzing like that. And he was bright and he was intelligent. And he was liked very much by men and women. Even the women used to, when he used to sit down, he always used to be the first, a woman would always come sit on his lap and put her arms around him. But he was not the type that put his arms around the back, and I'd go up to him and say, for God's sake, it's embarrassing. Why don't you put your arms around her? I know that you don't mean anything. He says, I don't want to. I don't like that. So, we had a very good married life. We had a good marriage. We had a good life. We really did. Very good life. I don't like what's happening in the world, but we've got to go through certain periods. I think eventually it will change. I just hope we're not getting so decadent in this society that we're going to follow the story of the fall of the Roman Empire. But it's, uh, there's always bad people, there's always good people in every race, religion, creed, and you live your life. You're not going to change the world, and you're not going to change other people. You want to live one way, you live that way. Somebody else wants something. You have to accept it. You know that old pro proverb, that saying, please God, let me learn to accept what I cannot change, and change what can be changed, and give me the wisdom to know the difference. And that's what this whole world is, life is consisted of. <laughs>